that are here tonight. Thank you for joining us to talk about Key Club. I know that it's probably very stressful at this moment as you educators are trying to figure out how do you keep your students engaged and how, how are you going to continue with virtual learning. Um, and for the Qantas advisors, I'm sure it's a struggle as well, um, supporting your faculty advisors. So I really appreciate you all taking an hour or two from your day to talk about Key Club this evening. It means a lot for myself. Also, I'm sure for you students and the community because Key Club does a lot. So let's get started. All right. So I have two things that I'd like to talk about today and let's start off with COVID-19 resources. Um, there are two sets of resources that are available to you all. The, the first set is the district task force resources and we work with the other districts to make some resources. Um, and there's a drive that has resources that pertain to virtual meetings, engagement, bonding, fundraising, and a whole lot more. And these resources were released on the 1st of August, and you can find them on our website and Lieutenant Governor newsletters. So if you've had a chance to review them um, or given a quick glance, send us an email back and tell us what you thought about it. And if you have any more resources that you'd like to see, because when we did these resources, we started in the summertime and we did not know what to expect. Uh, now that school started, we know what's going on. So reach out to us if you feel that there's something else that we need to look into further or add on. Um, because the point of the district is to support the, to support your, the clubs, um, and we want to do so in the best way possible. And the second set of resources, they were just released this month. Um, they're part of the Key Club International Monthly Updates. So you, you can find them through that. If you have problems with that, just send Key Club uh, PR message. And they have, as of now, the resources include possible meeting agenda items, how to host elections, and some partner promotions. So please give those resources a look, because I'm sure that they'll be definitely beneficial to your clubs. Um, it's our goal is to make your transition easier so that you don't have to figure these things out. And the second item I want to talk about is the governor's project. You know, this year is definitely strange. I'm sure you've heard about it many times. Uh, <laughs> so we wanted to continue with our normal functions of the district and invoke a sense of normalcy. And one of the things we always do is the governor's project. Um, so this year I'm proud to announce that the 2020-2021 Governor's Project is UNICEF, and I chose UNICEF for two main reasons. The first being that UNICEF supports over 190 countries. That's a lot of countries. I believe we have 196 countries, and that's almost 96% of them, and they've been doing this since 1946. So the work of UNICEF has been going on for a very long time. And the second reason is UNICEF does a variety of service. Some of the things that they do are they focus on education, child safety, clean water access. So if you have something you're particularly passionate about, I'm sure UNICEF does something for it. And you can earmark your donations to specific causes. And that's why I chose UNICEF, because they do a lot. They're not a one-issue charity. They focus on a broad matter, um, a broad spectrum of things. And you might be wondering, fundraising might be a bit harder this year. It is, for sure. And if you can, I would really encourage you all to support UNICEF. They, on October 1st, they plan on releasing a virtual orange box system. Um, we'll find out more when the 1st of October rolls around. But you can, as always, you can send checks and pay through a school credit card. Those are available options. And I want to make a comment on UNICEF. They're still doing their work. You know, COVID-19 has definitely shut down a bunch of things, but charities are still going on. Whether you're supporting UNICEF or any other key club partner, they're still continuing. They're still doing their work. You know, more recently, UNICEF set up efforts to support folks in the Lebanon explosion. Um, it's also important to note that UNICEF has the COVID-19 relief fund as well. They're still doing their work, and I would really encourage you all to try to support my governor's project this year and help me get to $15,000. Um, so next up, we have our secretary treasurer, Naraya Perea. Good evening. My name is Naraya Perea and I am the secretary treasurer of the Southwest District. Tonight, I will be discussing the topics of dues, officer certification forms, and the membership update center. First, I will be discussing the officer certification 
forms. As crazy as it sounds, the Southwest District does not have access to your officer information. Even if you've already held elections and entered your 2020 through 2021 officers in the membership update center. It is important for the district to have club officer names and contact information so our lieutenant governors can communicate with them and keep them informed of district and international happenings. We also want to make sure we have the proper advisor information. Because of this, I created a Google form for you or your president to complete. We call the form OCF short for Officer Certification Form, and we've put a link to this form in the chat. You can also access the form in the resources section of our website. I will now be discussing Membership Update Center. The Membership Update Center, or also known as the MUC, is your portal for tracking your club's membership and generating an invoice for your club to submit dues. The MUC can only be accessed by the faculty advisor on record, the Kiwanis advisor on record, and the Key Club secretary on record. In their October newsletters, your Lieutenant Governor will be asking you to make sure you can access your membership update center. If you are a new advisor, please email Karen at Karen at KarenChurch.com to get your access set up. If you're a continuing advisor but have forgotten your password, you'll want to email member services at kiwanis.org and they can issue a reset. In the upcoming months, you will be getting further instructions on how to manage members in the MUC and how to generate your invoice. But for now, we want you to know what the MUC is and make sure you can access it. Finally, I will be discussing dues. The 2020 through 2021 dues are the same as last year. Each member will need to pay $12 plus whatever your club dues are. After collecting your dues from the members and finalizing your roster in the MUC, you will be generating an invoice to have the $12 per member sent to Key Club International. Key Club International retains $7 and forwards $5 to our district. You do not need to send dues to two different places. Clubs who submit dues prior to November 1st will receive an early bird dues banner patch. In a typical year, Dues are due to Key Club International by December 1st, but they know this is not a typical year. Clubs are simply asked to get their dues in as soon as they are possible, and we understand for that may not be until second semester. Clubs will not be suspended for missing the December 1st deadline. Thank you. Thank you, Naraya. Next, we have our district bulletin editor to provide us with some updates. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Noah Chu, and I'm the district bulletin editor. And today I'll be talking briefly about the website, social media, and our district publication, The Key to the Southwest. So now starting off with the website, the Southwest district website, it serves as a way for key club members and advisors across the Southwest to access information easily. And as of today, I've made a couple updates to the district website. Um, and I intend to ramp up the amount of changes thus seen so far. You know, I've made a COVID-19 resources page and I intend to update the governor's project committee's page and implement the page allowing members of our Southwest district to opt in and out of our monthly Lieutenant Governor newsletters. To find all of these, please take a look at the website, which can be found at www.swdkeyclub.org. Now, the district publication is a medium length magazine published every few months that includes important traditional and fun key club information. To access the publication, find us on issue at Southwest District Key Club or find it on the Southwest District website where, it'll, where it will be posted soon. And as of today, I've published one issue of our volume 58 of the Key to the Southwest. It was published on August 31st and is now on the Southwest District issue page. It includes virtual decon, summer leadership conference, Kiwanis VCon recaps, and some quarantine service highlights. So I'm currently working on the second issue of our district publication and hope to get it published late November. Our social media offers valuable information about important events, dates, and deadlines that come up through the Key Club year. It is a direct pipeline for information from our district to students and advisors alike. For instance, 
Some of my most recent projects have been that of the Suicide Awareness Week cam campaign post. Aside from that, I currently am working together with our governor and lieutenant governors to help provide infographics that help our key clubs stay motivated and serve during quarantine. If you would like to take a look at any of these, please follow our Instagram at SWDKCI and our Facebook, Southwest District Key Club. Thank you. Thank you, Noah. And next we have our district convention chair to provide us an update. Hello, I'm Bryn Kramer, the decon chair for this year. So just to provide everyone with a little bit of an update on what we're looking at for decon this year. Uh, currently, we do not have anything set in stone with any hotels. So normally we would be looking at working with hotels by this point. And if we are to have an in-person uh, decon, we would be looking at the same hotel that we were planning on attending last year. But due to the whole Corona situation, we do not have a contract um, in the works with them right now. So that will take us to our next point, which is um, the discussion of whether or not we should have an in-person decon or a virtual decon. So naturally we would prefer to have an in-person decon just because ignoring all safety and health cost issues aside, it would be preferable to um, interact with everyone and just experience everything in person, but there are public health concerns. We don't necessarily know if any school districts are gonna be coming out with new field trip guidelines and how we might have to fit into that. Cost concerns because of the COVID, we might not be able to have multiple students in one uh, hotel room like we normally plan on having and we might not be able to fundraise. So all in all, there's a lot of potential issues with in-person, so as much as we might want it, it might not be the ideal situation. Virtually, if we do go virtual, it's not gonna look the same as the virtual conference we had last year. Uh, they were able to adapt to the situation very quickly and host a wonderful decon, but because we would be planning months in ahead and we'd be fully aware of the situation if we were to go virtual now. Um, it would not look the same. We would probably have a lot of different components. And this is just to let all of you know that there's gonna be these two options. And there's also a hybrid option that we may be looking at. And there's nothing that's really defined for the hybrid version, but you do know, you can know that there is the potential for schools to send fewer delegates and then we would have an online component for the workshops for all of your members to attend. We could have just the board and maybe judges coming to the hotel and being in person while we host our workshops all from the same place but broadcast them online. And we don't actually have any confirmed plans for that. But if you guys have any ideas, please feel free to share them in the chat or we're gonna be sending a link out to a poll and you can explore any ideas you have in the other option when we ask you if you would like to, if you would prefer to have an in-person or a virtual conference. So Karen just sent the link. And I know that you guys probably will have more questions about this or you might wanna share any ideas with us further and work on that, but we are going to move on to more pressing matters tonight because you guys are working on something much more urgent. So if you are interested in this, we are looking at having another town hall just about DECON uh, in later October. So keep an eye out for that and stay tuned. Thank you. Please make sure to take the poll in the chat. All righty folks, I'm back. So please take the poll, it's a one question poll no names, just a few, just one question. Um, all right, so I'm back to talk about the 2020-2021 standing committees. Um, so let me start off by defining some of these committees first. The first committee is the DECON committee, and they deal with all things that pertain to district convention. Um, next, we have the Qantas Family Relations Committee, and their goal is to really focus on strengthening the bonds between Kiwanians and the, the rest of the Qantas family. The next committee is the Membership Growth and Retention Committee. And as the name implies, they focus on growth and retention. You know, now more than ever, this is really needed as we need to find ways how we can 
get members virtually, but also keep them engaged. And the last committee is the Publicity and Service Engagement Committee. And this committee is focused on promoting and controlling our social media platforms. They come up with the content and they find ways to promote our key club partners. And I bring this up because this year we're doing something new. We're opening up the committees to the public and we're allowing students, um, all ranks from key club president, secretary, general members, to be a part of our district committees. Um, you know, it's really important that we increase the representation of your clubs in our district um, functions, because at the end of the day, if it doesn't work for the clubs, it won't work at all, because our job is centered around the clubs. So if you have any stellar students that you feel would be a great addition onto our committees, uh, please have them apply. We'll be sending this application in a few days, uh, preferably sometime on the 20th, um, and there will be an application and a service agreement form. We'd really like to see some of your students apply because it's a great opportunity and they can do, they can make change at a district level. So that is all I had in terms of committees. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out. And next up we have Jenny Wu of the San Pedro Division. Uh, Jenny. Hello everyone. Uh, so my name is Jenny Yu and I'm the San Pedro Division Lieutenant Governor. The first topic I'm going to go over this evening are Lieutenant Governors. So within the Southwest District Board, there is a Lieutenant Governor for each division. Lieutenant Governors are the people that serve as kind of a bridge or liaison between the district and club level. They relay important information and resources to clubs in order for them to be successful and grow to their full potential. The main goal of, of a lieutenant governor is to support clubs and to always be there when a club has any questions or if they need help with anything. And especially during a time like this, having strong communication and remaining in close contact with your division's lieutenant governor is super important because everything's constantly changing. So staying informed and keeping up with the information that lieutenant governor is sending out will make a, things a lot easier and less confusing. And one of the best ways to make sure that your key club has the latest information and resources is through newsletters, which brings me to the next topic, monthly newsletters. So monthly newsletters are sent out on the first of every month by Lieutenant Governors, and they contain extremely important information and useful resources for all clubs. They have information about the districts or the division, the, both district and divisions, latest events such as a PCM or a DCM, which I'll talk about soon. It has information about different obligations for a club, such as dues or officer certification forms. It has information and resources for virtual key club years, such as virtual service project ideas or how to host virtual meetings and a lot of other things like that. And the platform that's used to send out these newsletters is called MailChimp. And what MailChimp basically does is it gives the email a structured and cohesive look when they get sent out. And when those newsletters are sent out through MailChimp, an email inbox will usually recognize it as spam or promotions, which is why it's super important to be checking both the spam or promotions emails and inboxes in case that's where it gets sent and you don't see it by the second of each month. Newsletters are sent out in order to help clubs succeed, and it gives great tools to do so, which is why it's so important to read on a monthly basis. And next are PCM. So a President's Council meeting, or PCM, is where the presidents of each club come together within a division and give updates of their club. They have discussions and review important information. These meetings are crucial for all presidents to attend because they're able to get ideas of how to solve conflicts, different service project ideas, and get to know one another. A PCM is a great way to strengthen the team working skills of the presidents and give them the ability to pick and choose from the information and resources that they're getting and apply it to their own key club. So when all the presidents from a division are able to come together and put forward their best efforts of not only improving their own key club, but also helping improve the fellow key clubs in the division, great things can come from that and it can make a really big difference throughout the division and the district. So these results can also be seen from a DCM. And a divisional council meeting, or a DCM, is where club members, officers, and advisors come together to discuss district and international information, get club updates, and socialize with other people. 
these DCMs can sometimes also have a service project or an officer training conference, and DCMs with a service project are a great way to get informed and serve at the same time, and a DCM with an officer training conference is important because that's when the officers learn about their positions, what that position entails, their responsibilities, and they get an idea of what to expect from their term, and it just helps prepare them a lot more. And attending a DCM is very important because it gives a great opportunity for you to voice your thoughts and opinions. You can learn what's going on throughout the district and international level. You can learn about officer positions and responsibilities and build strong communication with the Lieutenant Governor and fellow key clubs. I would also like to note that currently and for the foreseeable future that PCMs, DCMs, and OTCs are all currently being hosted online. So that way it's, there's no concern about the health or anything like that. And overall, maintaining a strong relationship with your division's lieutenant governor, reading monthly newsletters, and attending district events are all important and contributing factors to making this service year a great one. Thank you all for your time. And that concludes what I wanted to discuss this evening. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, so I think that that concludes our district board update portion. Um, and so let me, not that anybody wants to see me, but let me be polite and turn my camera on. Because I now want to introduce um, and move towards what I hope to be a more interactive um, part of our town hall tonight, and uh, that is a panel-led discussion. And I and I really want to thank two fantastic advisors, Lori Smith from Cibola High School, uh, which is in the Albuquerque, uh, and Mel Otten from Paradise Honors High School, which is in Surprise, Arizona, which is a northwest suburb of the Phoenix Valley. Um, what we're going to do is we have um, a series of topics uh, that I'm sure everyone is facing, uh, and we're going to start with Lori and Mel's thoughts on some things and then open up to any questions, any issues, any uh, ways that you guys have dealt with the same issues in your club. Um, so without further ado, I know one of the challenges that a lot of clubs are facing right now is things ended abruptly last spring before you could hold your elections. Um, so Lori, I know that your club did a virtual election. Could you share your experience with the group on that? So we were about to do it, have elections. So it kind of rolled naturally, but I was really stuck about what to do. And so we had people who put their name in and we were running some of it through Google Classroom because we were already teaching through Google Classroom, but they had to, and we had a virtual meeting and they had to make a speech, who they were, what their office they wanted and, um, and what they thought they could do with that office or what their ideas were. And then in the middle of this, they asked me, well, can we just make a video ahead of time? And I'm like, I don't care. You know, video seems just as good as anything else. And they were kind of excited to make the video. And I think that put them, they felt a little less on the spot about making a speech. So then they had videos and they played videos and we had a, a, um, a virtual meeting and all the candidates made their speeches or played their videos about what they wanted. And then we kind of lucked out because, um, uh, the Lieutenant Governor is in our club. And so she couldn't run for office, but she could kind of manage the election. So I handed it off. So I wasn't a player in that. And we had a Google form for all of the, the offices and the people, and we sent it out and people voted based upon the Google form. Um, and it, it worked out real well, but the videos were kind of a surprise to me. And so finding a way that however they feel comfortable to present their platform seemed to give them some real opportunities and they were more interested in, in um, having some choices. 
Terrific. Thank you, Lori. Is there anybody else um, attending tonight who maybe held a virtual election or maybe you're at the point where you have your club has not yet elected officers and you're looking for some input or some direction? Everybody's being shy. Candy, please share. Please unmute and share. All right. All right. Here's my go. here's my question. Um, this weekend we're having, I think it's called DMC. I got all the the initials wrong, but they're having a district a key club meeting. I was invited by uh, Jenny, and um, so what I did is um, because this year I'm starting off with freshmen and sophomores because all my all my key clubbers graduated last year and we didn't have a chance to recruit younger kids. I mean, younger adults. And uh, so they're slowly but surely coming in. I'm kind of bribing them to come into the meetings with, with lollipops and pizza. But, <laughs> but I did invite them and, I had, and the, the two advisors are on my side, the two faculty advisors, I couldn't do it without them, are sending out an invitation for them to attend this, uh, this Saturday's meeting so they get an idea of what it's going to take for them to be an officer. And there's a couple kids that have already shown signs that they could possibly be uh, officers. So I'm excited about that. So I'm hoping against hope that I'll end up with some officers by the end of the weekend. And then the following Tuesday, they can start um, having meetings and, and uh, know what they're getting into with Key Club. So that's, I just wanted to share that because only a week ago was our first meeting of the mm -hmm. whole year. And uh, so when I got an email, because the teachers were kind of, you know, uh, saying, well, I don't know if we're going to be able to get started and all this, but we are meeting in person. I do have to get my temperature taken and wear a mask. And that's my, my only big challenge at all. At all. So anyway i'm just happy that it's getting started so well, i was worried about that thanks for sharing candy because i think one of the things that you mentioned um is a good point that sometimes i, I suspect a club has lost its entire officer crew um right. and so you don't necessarily know where your leadership potential is right. um, and so there may be a period where you get accustomed to your leaders and then you hold your election. Um, so, so Garrett, do you want to unmute and share your experience? Yes. Um, so we haven't yet done any officer elections because my advisor says that we should wait until next semester. And that's perfectly understandable. But it's just a little bit worrisome because we don't have a lot of people in our club right now. And well, a lot of our officers were seniors last year and they went when they graduated. And right now I'm the, I am currently acting president, but there's only one other person who wants to actually be an officer. And she doesn't want to be a vice president or anything. And I'm not sure if I should talk to my advisor and ask if we should do a virtual election or just wait. Um, and so I'll, I'll open it up for others who might have suggestions for you, Garrett. And as you can tell, um, Garrett is a student of ours from Petroglyph Division, correct, Garrett? Yeah. And, um, so my suggestion would be seeing that there isn't anyone chomping for the bit for the presidency or the other offices is spend this initial time growing your club, um, getting accustomed to whatever virtual meetings that you're having, develop some virtual service projects, and then move into grooming your officer positions. Um, and I think it's fantastic that your interim or acting president continue to play that role with the goal of getting a fully staffed or fully fully functioning club and then bring in your official officers. So I, I think your advisor is probably 
on, on the right path there, but definitely keep that communication open with them because it, we're all a team and, you know, it, especially if it's a small club or especially a tight team. Anybody else have any suggestions for Garrett? Sure. John Northcote from Las Cruces. Um, I, I don't know, I hope Vicky's out there in the weeds. We just had a meeting, uh, we've been, as a club, Qantas club, we're meeting virtually. And our topic of discussion today was our SLPs. The situation we have in Las Cruces, and I think this is a situation across New Mexico. I'm not sure how it is in Arizona. Uh, our schools are closed. You can't go into campus. Uh, there, there are no events, there are no clubs, there's nothing going on. So we're trying to think, uh, <laughs> we're trying to get in touch with all our advisors. I, I know we've lost two advisors that we're gonna have to find an advisor for those, for those clubs. So how, is, how are people making contact with their advisors and with their member. Yeah, and John, that's an excellent discussion point and something that I think we need to fully explore, but let's let's focus on the, the officers and the election process now, and then we'll move into that because that's Fine. a very important, important thing. And Lynn, I know that you were in the queue uh, for a comment. Sure. Um, my, my key club actually has, I'm really proud of them, they have gone above and beyond. I think, um, you know, they, they really vacillated back and forth, whether do we wait, do we hold off when to get started? I have a really um, enthusiastic advisor at the high school. And what she did, which I think was really smart, was, you know, she was in the same situation. She really lost the majority of her membership and all of her officers because they graduated and moved on to college or you know other activities. Um, but she reached out to other teachers and said, tell me who, who your leaders are. Who are the kids that have really stood out? And their first meeting, they had like 20 kids sign up, um, which I thought I was pretty impressed by. Uh, this has always been a pretty good sized club. And by the end of the first meeting, um, because these kids were designated and known as um, leaders, people that had maybe some background in service or at heart for that, um, there, there's, a, there's actually many of them that wanted to fill every single position. So I, I think it's just a matter of, you know, trying to work with your advisor um, I also think the idea of where we started out is we were having virtual meetings and that allowed a lot more kids to participate. They were already home, they were already homeschooling and it was just a, a break in their, in their afternoon that they could take and we were meeting at noon. So now I think it's gonna be a little bit of both, but you tend to get a lot more kids virtually, I think, just because the younger generation is just so used to that anyway. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't say stop. I would say, you know, you have, you, you know, in the time of COVID, you have to pivot and you have to look at other options. So that's worked really well for the school that I advise for. Thank you, Lynn. That's a great comment. And I'm glad that yeah. things went really well. Lori, you had a comment. You know, the other thing I think, Garrett, you know, bring in your lieutenant governor to your meeting and introduce them and help them realize it's a bigger organization. Some of them may not wanna take a leadership role and be in charge of, of like a huge thing, when they, but they realize it's bigger and there's health and different kinds of dynamics going on. Sometimes that triggers some kids um, desire to, to take a bigger role when they realize it is bigger. And now, um, John had, had progressed us into what I would consider perhaps the next big topic, which is that virtual meetings, um, the engagement of students. And I know just based on what I'm hearing that a club that is excelling at this is Paradise Honors. So, so Mel, if you could unmute and kind of share what you guys are doing um, with your meetings and with keeping morale and engagement up with your students. 
Okay, thanks, Karen. Um, first of all, I'm kind of in the same boat a lot of you. We had most of our uh, officers were seniors last year, so they, they left. So we've got a very young group. In fact, most of our officers are only one year in to Key Club. And that doesn't mean they're not enthusiastic. They don't have that, that four-year background that a lot of schools do have. Um, we started at the end of last year, we kept going. So meaning we kept going through club through May and we set up a Google Classroom. And I think someone else, John or someone else mentioned that. Um, and so that's kind of been our primary format. They meet, they go to meet and that's where we have given them the link and they go to it. Uh, we've had two clubs, well over the summer, we actually had movie nights. So once every couple of weeks, we'd show a movie and invite our kids and we got iffy response, but it was still keeping our name out there, keeping things going. Um, luckily for us though, we had done at least mo most of our elections before everything hit the fan. So we've been lucky we had a core group of officers already, but we've had two groups now, or two meetings, and we really worked on, um, for one, the first meeting, just bonding. We actually broke in and in meets into breakout rooms and we played four or three or four different kind of games or get to know you things, two, three truths and a lie, things like that. Um, last week, we actually did a service project online where they were making cutouts and painting rocks and stuff, kind of um, positive messages. And they would take pictures of that and we gave them service hours based on how many they did. So we're, you know, just like everything else, we're not going back to school until October 21st at the earliest. So we've got at least a few more weeks of going through this. We've had a lot of interest. We um, actually have added to our officers because through this, we because we did not have our directors yet. So we have just been interviewing directors right now. Um, but we have 45 kids coming kind of consistently. So it's all about word of mouth. We have, we're definitely using social media to get these kids interested. Um, and I think it's a lot of personal contact between our officers, between me, I'm bugging my students um, every day, you know, key club tonight, you should come. Um, and it's, it's working. So I, I'm just finding it's, it's really working well but I don't know how long it will work until it gets old. I'll go with that. Yeah, well, that, that's an excellent point, Mel. Um, and thank you for sharing your experiences. I, I, I really appreciate the movie nights and I understand you know, the concept of maybe there's not heavy participation, but it's an opportunity to engage. Um, and you know, the students are no different than us if given an opportunity to engage with human beings these days, we take it. Um, and so I applaud you for, for, for the efforts that you're making uh, with that engagement. Anybody else have online meeting successes that you wanna share? Type your name in the chat and uh, we'll get you called on. I'm trying to get in there. My video thing is not quite working, so I apologize. <laughs> no, no worries. I'm like, ah, oh. it's been, it's been really wonky with even at school. So I apologize. Um, so our key club, hi everybody. First of all, I'm from Willow Canyon high school, right down the road from Mel at paradise honors where my son actually graduated from over there with Mel. <laughs> but, um, our kids have been doing, um, every two weeks. So our school has started. Um, it just started for freshmen this week, but in person, but we've been obviously doing everything online and our key club board was picked, um, except for our class reps and, um, but our board was picked before we left school. So they worked a lot over the summer about how they can get everyone engaged and try to recruit via online and stuff like that. Um, We've been holding our meetings every two weeks um, where it's obviously student led, but the kids have been doing a great job with asking questions. What do they see as, um, what do the students see themselves, non-board members of wanting done, how they think it should be done. So they, they were asking a lot of input from prospective members 
um, which really helped. It made them also feel like they were a part of it, even though they can't be there and meet in person. Um, we also used our, what's called the morning roar, um, which is like the, um, like the announcements, the daily announcements or whatever. We're still doing that once a week it goes out while we're still online. And so they would type messages in and stuff like that. And then that would get uploaded onto the morning roar on the YouTube, which would then be played to all of the classes at our high school. Um, and we were able to recruit that way, but the kids came up with all those ideas and it worked really well. So um, next week, I think is gonna be our first in-person meeting. So um, that will be good. <laughs> That's, that's terrific, and I, I think that's a very clear example of what Lynn was saying, that we just need to pivot. We need to uh, change, perhaps, how we're viewing things and look to do new things. Uh, Dr. Gertz from North High School. All right. I'm going to uh, pop up here. Sorry, guys, these buttons are all different. Um, so my club, we've decided to move ourselves to quarterly meetings. And what um, our next meeting, so we had one, it was very well attended. We were able to make some decisions, paying for our dues and so forth. Our next quarterly meeting is going to be a lunch meeting. And what the officers came up with is that we're going to have a pizza delivered to each individual member. And our club is relatively small, so we have about 15, 16 students. And rather than spending our money on t-shirts for this year, we're gonna have a pizza lunch and we'll all join together with hopefully our pizzas getting delivered at the same time. How awesome is that? And I don't know if you saw Governor Eric's face, but he was all over that idea of having pizza delivered. Yeah, it's, you know, and I'm gonna say, pa, if you tell Papa John's uh, that it's for a school, it's a $7 uh, single item pizza with delivery. So um, it's, you know, fairly affordable. Terrific idea, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, let's hear now. So we've heard some wonderful successes and some great ideas. Who is having challenges, uh, you know, and I, I, I don't know what your screens look like, but I see Peter right there, and I know that he lives in a rather rather rural part of New Mexico in Silver High School. Um, you know, is there anybody who's having challenges trying to coordinate meetings with students? I think right. I'm just I'm trying just to catch my breath, really. Um, I don't know. It's I'm just kind of in the same boat as many other people. All my seniors left. My freshman that came in, um, and I was a new advisor, um, they just kind of uh, flaked away. Um, they wanted the fun, but they didn't want the service. So I just told them, uh, Key Club is service, and this is what we do. We serve others, and we can have fun, but there's times we have to put on gloves and we have to pick up trash. There's times we got to play kids with the kids and paint the faces and and do that stuff. But it it's not student council where it's rah rah rah. Let me get that guy's number. Let me talk to that girl and go to a dance. It's service, and I don't know how everybody else feels, but here that's. I don't know. It's just not the cool thing. The seniors get it, but they're gone. <laughs> and the freshmen, they're all sophomores. I'm like, hey, you want to come back out? They're like, no, you're a jerk. And I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> I'm just going to tell it how it is. Um, you're here to serve. And if you're not here to serve, there's no point. And so I, I put that on my announcement. I, I'm very blunt. I, I, I don't beat around the bush. And um, I know some of you, you know, use lollipops and pizza and, and that's cool. That's cool. But me, uh, I'm, I'm 48 and I don't want to deal with this. I want, I want somebody to serve and I want you to be here and I will spoil you if you're here. But if you're not going to do that, I just, I don't know. Wow. So that's me. So I think I got five kids, including my daughter who I've, 
tried to um, rope in. And maybe that's a good thing. We're just going to start at the base level and we're just going to serve. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, we got a doctor here uh, on the club. And as everybody knows here, we're probably educated people, bachelors and masters, doctor degrees. Seems like to me, the more education you get, and I got a master's plus nine, which isn't much, the more I end up being a servant to other people. And, you know, most of the time, if you become a doctor, a medical doctor, um, it's the sick you see, the poor, not the rich, unless you need plastic surgery. But those are very few. So that's, I'm that's a little skewed. <laughs> so I haven't really had a meeting. We kind of send it out there. Hey, come join. And eh, I don't know. What are they going to do? Take away my birthday? So. <laughs> well, so, so I'm sure that that's a challenge. The, the whole recruitment in an age of virtual meetings when students aren't on campus, you can't hang a flyer up on the hall because nobody's gonna see it but teachers. Um, so Lori, you had a comment and then, uh, while Lori's talking, let's think about other recruitment ideas for this social distancing so, or distance learning environment. So you asked for challenges in the virtual meeting and I was just going to tell you what my challenges are. One, it's hard, they don't turn their cameras on right? And so it is the most, it is just not energy generating to talk to their little letters. Or they do this. And you see their ceilings. So that that's difficult, you know, and you try to figure it out. And we haven't done like breakout rooms or whatnot. But one of the things that I really noticed and is they don't like to talk but they will chat anything and everything. So you have to really watch the chat and also the wait time to get them to say something. You know, in, in the real life, you look at them and you can see their facial expression or their, their lips start to move and you're like, oh, they have something to say or they're so used to raising their hand in class, but it takes them way longer to speak in a virtual meeting. So you really have to be prepared to have that think time or wait time, or they don't know how to alternate with each other, if that makes sense. But it, it's, a, it's really different waiting for them to, um, to talk or to speak or even to chat. It's, it's way different, I think. I think, I think we would agree. We, we started with the district board on um, the same type of thing, talking to black boxes. And uh, then we started forcing people to turn their cameras on, right, Bryn? <laughs> and the engagement is very different when you have your camera on because you can see, like you said, Lori, you can see when somebody's about, you know, the gears are going and they have something that they want to say, but maybe they need to be coaxed out of saying it. Um, so I, I definitely encourage, and I hate being on camera. So if I'm willing to do it, force people to do it because it really does bring a different perspective to your meetings with the students. Um, and Garrett, did you have a comment on recruitment or on virtual meetings? Um, recruitment. All right, let's So last year, um, I was president too. Um, there were a lot of people within our club, I'd say about 30 of them, but not a lot of them were actually getting involved, right? And it was honestly really frustrating. I've tried getting them to get more involved, to come to events and fundraisers and all that. And the officers especially got a little bit lazy and I, it was just uh, three of us that were actually doing most of the work. And so I had this idea to do exclusive recruitments. Like there's a lot of people I know who would make good key clubbers. And I was thinking, hey, 
why not do exclusive recruiting where we instead go to people individually we think would be fits for Key Club instead of hanging flyers and doing booths and saying, hey, come join our club. It's like, um, hey, I know you and you're, you seem like a really good fit for Key Club. Would you like to come to one of our meetings and see if you would like to join? Great idea, great idea. And in fact, those of us who are Kiwanians on this call know that that is the way that we are taught to recruit Kiwanians. Tony, I don't know if you're still on here, but you probably would agree with that. Tony's our Kiwanis membership director for the district. Um, so Dr. Gert, you had, a, you had a comment on virtual meetings. Yeah, all right. So let me f figure out which buttons to push here. So I want to talk a little bit about um, ki kids and being on camera. There are children, students, young people who love being at the center of attention. Ma they are the minority. They're the ones that you see on YouTube, but you're not seeing everybody. And so as you're asking students to turn on the cameras for discussions, I'd like to propose that Perhaps what you do is rather than uh, making them turn on their cameras, which gets into body issues, bullying issues, and so forth, um, have each student do a interesting profile picture, something that represents them. And so you're not looking at their face, which they may not be happy about it, they are teenagers, but have them select a picture that represents them. And then you're having a little bit more of a conversation. I, I have done that in my own classrooms and um, it has completely eliminated um, this fight or this confrontation or this argument about turn your camera on. There are students who are comfortable turning it on and I let the students set their pace. Um, so I just wanna talk a little bit about that psychological, emotional feelings of turning on your cameras. And I tell them, hey, if I'm willing to turn on my camera, then you should be too. But that I haven't gotten anybody to buy that. But there's very definitely a psychological component to their hesitation. And, and then that's an excellent perspective. And thank you for sharing that with us. And you know, I the the favorite picture is a great idea. I've also seen you know, come dressed in costume. Um, has been fun. I went to, uh, Jenny had shared with you guys the, the alphabet soup that we live with, DCMs, PCMs. I went to a PCM yesterday where it was take, bring your dog. You know, so everybody had their dog. And of course we all want to show off our dogs. Um, so that got everybody's cameras on. So there are ways to do it. And it is good to remember that, um, People are all coming from different places. And so thank you for sharing that perspective. Um, so let's, let's move on from um, kind, of, kind of shift that from virtual meetings to that, how do you, now you've got your club, you're working, how do you function with your officer corps? Um, so Mel, can you share some thoughts on what you guys are doing at Paradise Honors to get that advisor officer relationship going? Yeah, we've, I'll, I'll be honest, we, we've certainly had struggles with our officers in the past, and we've actually had to boot a couple here and there um, for different reasons. But we really try bonding. Um, in the past, of course, we've done things like bowling and things like that, or um, just a, a food night or something. We went out a couple of weeks ago, and we, we were, weren't really sure if we should do it, but we all met for brunch at a, at a local restaurant and spent a couple hours just kind of doing business, but also just bonding a little bit and getting to know each other. Um, I think I'm finding that the more I communicate with them, we, we use Basecamp as a tool to communicate. And while it's not perfect, I mean, there's a bunch out there, we are probably communicating three or four times a day. Just quick little text, hey, did we do this? What's going on? But like my president, she has just signed up to go into the Marine Corps for next year when she graduates. So she's been struggling with MEPs and stuff. And so, um, you know, uplifting her there. I mean, so again, trying to build those bonds has been really helpful. Um, at the same token, we had our vice president 
uh, resigned last week. He just, you know, he, he didn't, could, it wasn't what he thought, I guess, being online, but we were able to move some officers around and, and we fixed it. So I think knowing them, knowing what they're going through, I mean, this is just like in teaching or in this everyday life, relationships are important um, and knowing limitations. So when you have someone who maybe doesn't feel comfortable as secretary, help them out, give them some you know, pointers, maybe have connect them with last year's, even if they're in college or something, they almost always are gonna be willing to help. Um, heck, Eric has come into a few of our meetings um, just to be there and share with us and hang out. And, and I really appreciate that because after the meeting they go, he's the governor, really? And he was here? So yeah, I mean, so I think what I'm just seeing is um, You've got you've to build those relationships. You've got to teach them without doing it for them. And I think that's what I love as an advisor. They can sink or swim. I'm just certainly there to, to give them pointers, maybe what to do or how not to do it. But it's certainly up to them. So I don't know if that's, that's why I've been really blessed with my officers, I will tell you. Thank you for sharing, Mel. And does anybody go ahead and type in the chat if, if if anybody has had any experience, um, perhaps that's different from, from normal years where we're meeting in person, um, that's helped build that relationship with your officers. And I see, see Kim's comment in the chat, uh, that bonding and relationships, I, perhaps more important now than in prior years where you were surrounded by bonding and relationships. Um, Garrett, yeah. What are you guys doing? Well, this was actually in the past when I first joined Key Club in my freshman year. What we actually did one time that bonded the officers was we had dinner together. Like our advisor is a culinary teacher at the high school. And it was just one afternoon when our advisor had some ma leftover macaroni and cheese and um, me and another student had made some cup, not cupcakes, some muffins for other reasons. And we kind of just like said, hey, we should all have dinner get together. And that's what we did. And it really bonded everyone. And what really also helped is that um, we just hung out together uh, during lunch and after school. And we also had class together, culinary class. And uh, we just hung out together and that really bonded the officers. So uh, maybe you, sh maybe it's not good to actually force the officers to hang out together, but bring one of your officers aside and say, hey, you should plan something with the rest of the officers. And if they agree to it and do that, it could potentially bond your officers together and maybe even get the club in on it and say, hey, we're having a dinner. Does anyone want to come? Thank you, good, good sharing. And you know, everybody has their different risk tolerances right now, of course, um, and so perhaps not every advisor and every student is gonna feel comfortable meeting in person, um, but there certainly are things that people can do. You know, maybe you have a picnic lunch um, in the park or, you know, somewhere outside so that you can keep your social distancing. Uh, but, you know, keep in mind everybody's different comfort levels. And I wanna be cognizant of the time. I know that, I know that we just went over an hour. Um, so I want to discuss um, dues because I know for a lot of you, dues run through your bookstore and your bookstore may not be as accessible as it typically is. And so Lori, I know you and I were chatting yesterday um, about logistic issues with paying dues. So Lori, why don't you share your story and then let's talk about maybe what some solutions, some options might be. Okay, so in New Mexico, we are virtual till December. And because we don't have students in the building, they're not, they're not charging class fees. So we were considered part of that thing for class fees. 
but I approached the principal and I said, you know, my, I don't have fees, I have dues. I have national dues that have to get paid. And I have money in my budget because we didn't go to decon, but I don't, I don't want to use my money because I'm not sure how fundraising is going to be. So is there a workaround plan? And truthfully, she didn't know or think about me and my dues problem. But NHS also has the same issue. So if you have NHS in your schools, they also have to pay national dues. Um, and that may be a restriction. So um, my bookkeeper wouldn't even accept my money, even if I, you know, found, you know, stood outside McDonald's and had my kids come by and hand me money, I didn't have a way to give it to my bookkeeper. But we're working on that and there may be kind of a workaround plan. And I actually had like, you know, we would like to run it through the computer system where they pay like their normal school fees, but that may not happen. But in my head, I'm, I actually am having a drive by dues collecting station. And I don't know if I'm going to be at McDonald's. I think I may be at the park under a shade tree, but see if I can, because, you know, I'm legal to do that in New Mexico. I can't have a face to face meeting with my students. However, we can drive by. So I may be drive by, collect dues, but it was interesting because, you know, they're making so many decisions at the administration level, but they don't know all the particular ins and outs of every little thing. And so, um, but when we talked, so I, we talked about at our club, our kids were a little weird about even charging dues. And I'm like, well, this is a commitment, you know, we, we're just going to do the dues that are required. And then if we want to have our own kind of dues. And when we talked about it, they could understand the benefit of it and paying that way up front. So you're only paying for people who are going to, you know, a little skin in the game, pay the dues that they have and kind of see. And I told them, if we're not a legal club, then we're not legal for anything else either. And so it, it, the, the money's a hard call for them right now. And we usually have a kid or two who needs a scholarship. So that, that's not a big deal. We've done that in the past as well, kind of deal, but. So, and, and I suspect that there are others of you that are in the same position. Um, and so one of the suggestions, and those of you who are Kiwanis advisors on this call, I want you to listen up because this involves you and your Kiwanis clubs, um, is you know, frequently, we leave the field of dues to the school and the faculty advisor. Uh, but perhaps this is a year where we Kiwanians step up and either process the dues payments from the kids. You know, we, we go stand with Lori and do the drive-by for kids to drop off checks or cash. And we deposit them in our Kiwanis Club account and write a check to Key Club International. Or, for those perhaps who are well healed, you just pay the dues. Um, and uh, the other thing that I would include in that conversation is absolutely keep in mind that we're gonna have students whose parents have been economically impacted by COVID um, and they're not gonna have the $12. So maybe have some scholarship opportunities with your Kiwanis Club to cover that $12 for those students who, who you know, their parents are trying to put food on the table right now and pay the rent. Uh, so I think this is really a year for we Kiwanians to shine for our key clubbers. Um, and that might just be being the logistics for the payment of dues, or it could be going beyond that. Um, but I would really like to encourage the Kiwanians on the call to think of how you can help your key clubbers in this regard. Um, Kiwanis Club, Candy, mentioning that you guys do have a budget, which is fantastic. And I, and I know that a lot of Kiwanis Clubs have been impacted by fundraising restrictions. Um, you know, my home club puts on 4th of July fireworks. Well, there were no 4th of July fireworks this year. Um, Albuquerque Clubs, you rely on balloon fiesta for funds, and there will be no balloon fiesta this year. So I know Kiwanis Clubs are strapped. Um, and if you can't pay for the dues, that's okay, but at least be there as a service to help process the payment of dues if your key club needs it, if the bookstore is closed and not processing. Um, so Candy, did I see you raising your hand? Yeah, I just wanted to say that we've always had the stance of the third, the third, the third, you know, uh, for like the decon and all that. 
well, our kids didn't do decon, but we had the same budget. We have we we have about a two thousand dollar budget for our key clubbers, but we just don't hand them the money. We encourage them to earn their own and also figure out. But you know, we've got businesses that will allow them to have car washes and stuff like that. But like in this case, this year, if we need to help them out, we have that option because one, we didn't use the money last year. And two, we still have this year's budget. We decided to leave it the same. So our, our club is knock on wood healthy right now, but we, we are watching our dollars too. Yeah, well, and, and certainly, I know we all would love to be able to think that we're gonna be getting together in the spring for a district convention, um, but I think we all realistically know the chances of that are somewhat slim. Um, so there will probably not be hundreds of dollars that have to go out per student in the spring. Um, so perhaps that frees up some of those tight funds. Um, but, oh yeah, yeah, and my dad, Maury Pongratz, who is the Kiwanis advisor to Los Alamos High School, um, mentions that key leader this year and actually going forward is virtual um, and so some Kiwanis clubs have a budget for sending kids to key leader. Well, now you can maybe apply that budget to scholarships because the virtual do scholarships because the virtual key leader is free. Um, so we do have as Kiwanians perhaps some flexibility in our SLP support budgets. And I just want you guys uh, to be aware that there might be opportunities to help out there. Um, and so the last thing that I would just like to touch on is I'd like to touch on virtual service. Um, so if your key clubs have been involved with service since the whole COVID shutdown, um, put your name in the chat because I'd like to hear what you guys have done. Mel. Okay, um, we got really lucky and again, um, getting back to our officers they've been hustling to find stuff but we found um someone through the american cancer society and they needed something like twenty-five thousand phone calls be to be made for different events that are happening and so basically we got in touch with them they gave us a phone list and they suggested giving an hour of service for every 20 phone calls whether they connect message whatever so we've had a lot of kids already making pretty good service hours just making phone calls. Um, that's been kind of a, a bigger thing. And then we've done other things where just little things like pick up around your neighborhood, pick up garbage or, you know, write letters to different groups, so first responders or something, to give us proof of that and we're giving them service for that also. So we've been very flexible, but this Cancer Society one has been really um, awesome, I thought for us. Yeah, that, that sounds fantastic. I'm gonna, I'm gonna reach out to you and get that information so that we can share it in our COVID resources. Cause Eric, I don't think we have that in there, do we? No, okay. Um, Erica. No, we don't. This is great. Okay. <laughs> we will add it though. Um, Erica, can you share your story? Hi. Um, yes, um, we really not really stopped over the year. Um, my clubs are a di little different because they're homeschoolers. Um, so they, they joined as homeschooling clubs. Um, so they've been out in the community. One project that they're doing, um, which is being spearheaded by my son, who's the president, is um, mowing lawns for those who are in need. Um, he got a lot of equipment donated um, and funds from his Kiwanis Club for him to mow lawns for free for elderly and, and um, weed eating, blowing, whatever he needs to do. So um, they've um, pledged to do 100 yards this year. So they're about, I think he's done about 10 so far. Um, so they're doing that. And then also our Kiwanis Club has been doing a food pantry. So he's been going and helping with that as well. So it's been nonstop for us. <laughs> um, and we're having our first virtual meeting tomorrow. So we'll see how that goes. Hey, that's terrific. And I tell you, mowing lawns in Phoenix in the summer is, uh, that's service hours the hard way. Uh, <laughs> let's see, I saw Kim. 
So we started writing letters probably back in, I think it was April um, for the kids, especially the seniors to finish up their service hours. But we sent a, like a Google form out and asked um, our, our club kids, like where they have their grandparents or wherever throughout the United States or through the world um, that was secluded. And so we ended up finding places of um, long-term living facilities and nursing homes that were, we did one in Illinois, Arkansas, and Texas. And all the kids wrote letters um, and sent them there and they got service hours for every like letter or stamped envelope. They would take a picture and send it to me. So like every, every so many, they got service hours for that. And um, we actually got letters back where these, um, where they actually signed their names themselves on a card and sent them back to us. I got that over the summer. It was the cutest thing. That, that's terrific. Excellent. So they read it. Yeah, the, I guess the activities directors of these places, the long-term facilities, read it during all their activities during the weeks. And so it went to all the residents and they got to put them in their rooms and stuff. It was really cool. That, that is very cool. That, that absolutely made some people stay too, I'm sure. Um, so I know that we're quickly approaching um, more, perhaps, the time that I wanted to keep you guys tonight. Um, I'm, I'll hang out here for a while. So if you guys have questions, I'm, I'm sure Eric will hang out too because we live and breathe Key Club. Um, so I really want to appreciate or say how much I appreciate you guys all being on. Um, and I'm going to let Eric have the closing words. Yeah, so, you know, I'd really like to thank the uh, 60 participants we had this evening. It really means a lot that you guys still have Key Club on your radar, you know. Um, and I'm sure you guys have seen it. You, you've been doing this for many years, but the impact you have on students is tremendous. And, you know, I know that COVID-19 has definitely put an end on a bunch of our plans, but it's really nice that we're continuing with Key Club. And I'll tell you, please reach out to your lieutenant governors, you know, respond to them because they, they're really waiting for you guys to respond to them. And if you have, thank you so much. You know, the they're, they're, job is to help you. You know, if you have any questions, if you need anything, your lieutenant governor will be there to support you. Um, so once again, thank you. I hope that you found this informational. If you have any questions that are left unanswered, don't hesitate to reach us. Um, We'll, if we don't have the answers, we'll get them for you. Um, thank you once again. So that's all. I'll be sticking around too. So Karen, yes, this yes. Is, sorry, <laughs> I, I, I'm in the process of going to get a new phone and it's very frustrating when I'm teaching my freshman in class and I have my, um, the rest of my upperclassmen on my cell phone because it's too hard to walk around with my computer in the hand in the classroom, but I can't, they can't see me, <laughs> but they can hear me. Um, I really would like to get that information. Um, for Mel or whoever can um, can get that because that's amazing. Um, I would like to give that um, to my board and have them vote on doing that. Yeah, with, absolutely, absolutely. Mel's going to send it to me, and then um, we're going to send a recap and some handouts to everybody that was on the call. So I will absolutely include that. And Mel, you may have Kim. Do you have Kim's contact information directly? Oh, he's still I on there. <laughs> I'm sure somewhere I do, but it wouldn't hurt to get it again. So, you know, if anything, yeah. maybe Karen, if we could get a list of everyone. Absolutely. Here, mm -hmm. You know, that would help. Yep. We'll do that. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. That's amazing. I love that. That's so awesome. I, that is fabulous. Yeah. Well, they said they had 25,000 people to call and I don't think we're going to do them all. <laughs> be some big service hours. <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> Darren, I have a question for you. Yeah, done. 
Okay, so every fall for many years now, I've been looking forward to receiving a box of folded up orange containers for trick or treat for UNICEF. Yeah. And we give those to our key kids clubs, mm -hmm. to our builders club, and we actually ask the key clubbers to spread those around to businesses around town. Well, apparently that's not going to happen this year. You're talking about a virtual orange collection box, and I, I'd like to get some more details on that. Yeah, you know, and, and I would too. Um, I, ever since I got the email, I've been saying I need to read it. Um, Eric has some information though, I think. Eric? Well, I mean, I'll tell you, I know as much as you do, you know, they plan to release all this information on the 1st of October. Um, you, you know, you can, if you, if you have Facebook, you know, those birthday fundraisers, you can think about it in that form. You know, when I get that information, I will be sure to forward it to you all because I'm also waiting. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, and, and with UNICEF being Eric's governor's project, um, we will absolutely make sure that people know how to pr participate in Trick or Treat for UNICEF. That's important. Yeah. Um, I had... Oops, Gary, you kind of froze. DCMs and the DCMs. Will I be getting an email to a link to do to those meetings? Yeah, you know, is, is Xander still on the call? I think Xander left. Um, Garrett, are you not receiving those links? I'm if sorry, what was that? If you're not receiving- Oh wait, yeah, the links. The links. Okay, send, send me your email. I'll get you connected with Xander so that Xander can uh, give you all the information you need. And for, um, oh, go ahead, sorry. I, I have Xander's email. No. Yeah, and I was just looking at the calendar. But I don't- If you would I'll, like my email, I can go ahead and put it in. Oh, no, that's fine. Xander coordinates all these events. Uh, he didn't have one this month, I think. So just talk to him and see what his plans are. And the same goes okay. for, for the rest of you advisors. Um, it, you should be getting newsletters from your Lieutenant Governor. Um, Eric and I have noticed that not all of the Lieutenant Governors are perhaps sending their newsletters to the Kiwanis advisors. So they have been instructed to change their ways and make sure that the Kiwanis advisors are getting the newsletters. Um, but there's lots of good information in there, including when PCMs and DCMs are happening. Um, so if you are not getting a newsletter from your Lieutenant Governor, send me an email and we will make that happen. Yeah, Mr. Norbert had a question. Um, how are you advisors getting and maintaining your student contact information? Sorry if I cut somebody off. Um, you know, it, it's tough, right? Because you're, you're not on campus with people. Um, so I don't know if anybody has had success that's still on the call with maintaining that contact uh, with the student's mail. Well, like I said earlier, we have a, um, well, we start off with our Google Classroom Key Club page. So we just are putting everything on that now, but we also have them fill out a membership, a Google form, membership form that has phone numbers, all that stuff that we normally do on paper. Mm -hmm. So, and that converts to a spreadsheet. So yeah, so once they've done that, we do have all that information, which really hey, helps Mel? us. Mel? The, yeah. Um, I got a situation here where I had to, <laughs> the advisor quit and they changed the name of, from Yachty High School to Oregon <laughs> High School. Okay. So I'm not only dealing with a, a missing advisor, uh, and I, I'm kind of broaching this question to you teachers who are advisors, how you are dealing and interfacing with your administration to keep your clubs afloat. Well, I'm the I'm the creaky wheel that keeps bugging them. For one thing, I'm I probably email them two or three times a week with 
not demands, but the questions like, how are we going to pay for dues? How are we going? Can, can we fundraise this? So kind of keeping our name out there. Um, you know, and it's, and I'll tell you for us, we have a ton of clubs and they're all good and they're all competing for stuff. So I think the more you get out there, both to the kids, to the faculty and whatever, I think that will certainly help help you get at least keep those con those connections going. And John, I would also suggest that um, you, if you have some contacts amongst the students, that them interacting with the administration on the importance of the club to them is probably going to be extremely helpful. Um, you know, we have, just so you, just so you feel a little better, you are not the only club that lost a faculty advisor this year. We had significant changes in faculty advisors. Um, you know, a lot decided that this would be a really good year to retire. Um, so you guys are not alone. It's an issue that a whole bunch of people are facing. And I think if you tag team it with the students and the Kiwanis Club, both sharing your views on how important the key club is, it's going to be a lot more successful. And it might take some patience. Um, you know, I suspect the last thing any teacher wanted to do during the first weeks of virtual school was to take on a club. Um, so having a little patience and sharing the importance and having the students share the importance uh, would be my approach. And I don't sure. know if anybody else has suggestions. Yeah. Are any of you interacting with the principals and with the superintendents? The, are, are you directing to faculty advisors or to Kiwanis advisors? Well, I, I think both, you know, because as Kiwanis advisors, we are known in the community. We know people in the community. Uh, we probably go bug the school board uh, and they deserve it. Uh, but trying to reach out and say, okay, how am I going to get these students to stay? How do I get this contact information? One, I need to get an advisor up who's within the infrastructure of the school. I mean, I can walk up to the door and the door's locked. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're not going home. Any of us in Las Cruces, we're not going, if we get in by January, if we even see we're at virtual right now. And I don't foresee us uh, getting face-to-face -face interaction anytime in, in the near future. And my fear is I've got four key clubs mm -hmm. in Las Cruces. I've got four high schools. Uh, I probably could get well, the Christian school. I probably could get a couple of charter schools if I had enough Kiwanians to be Kiwanis advisors. But trying to hold this whole thing together, and I'm sorry that Vicki has left, because we had a meeting today and Vicki was there and she's even suggested we're even thinking about uh, virtually bringing the four key clubs together into virtual meetings. Mm -hmm. One big virtual meeting wow. of all the key clubs um, just to keep them interacting, maybe have joint pro projects. Is anybody thinking along that line out there? I, I think that's a great idea. Um, I yeah. I think that even having them interact with Kiwanian groups, Builders Club groups, um, K Kids groups is also, you know, really beneficial to everyone that's involved. Right. So I know that our key club, which is La Cueva Key Club, um, they use something called Remind, which is they can send out a text and it goes to every member that's in the club. And it's a way for them to, you know, send out information of meetings that are coming up or projects that are coming up or give the uh, the student members ways of um, signing up online to to do various projects and yes it's been a lot more difficult to come up with projects that don't involve actually getting together and interacting um, I think that's where we're having our hardest time it's a sort of a shift in a mindset of you know, doing doing things in person to doing it more virtually long distance yeah. but i think they're going to get there it just it takes some shifting initially. laura we use remind 
and it works great because mm -hmm. it's faster than email. It's a text, and they know how to use text, yeah. but it's yeah. it's safe. Everyone it's not like phone your phone them. number kind of thing. Right, right. Because I it from my builders I mean, club, and I think. Oh really? Yeah, but my advisor decided to run off to Arizona and get married. <laughs> uh, so I'm trying. I'm gonna try to get with the principal and get a new advisor. But, but I have her mind through there, and I'm. I'm gonna see if maybe I can get our advisors to get Remind up and running. That way we can have that touchstone because as the Qantas advisor, we're on that and we can send messages. Right now, I, I'm stumped about how to uh, even get to, uh, if we don't have private phone numbers, how to even get to uh, just the advisors. Well, they won't want us to have these students. Uh, yeah. Do, do you have your contact information for your advisors? If it is current, we got. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> I've got. That's the challenge. <laughs> I've got three that we can reach out. We're getting uh, some response. Some advisors are coming back. Vicky is being really great, and she's at Centennial. And she's kind of taken it upon herself to talk to the other advisors of the other high schools and act as a liaison between all the high school advisors and the club. Okay. So we're, we're seeing, so my biggest uh, is going to try and get uh, Anyate, Oregon, or whatever they are today. We think it's going to be Oregon so they don't have to change the O on yeah. the uniform. So the, uh, the other thing I'm going to suggest, John, is um, Trinity is your lieutenant governor for Key Club. Okay. Uh, and I hope that she's been including you on her newsletters. She's fabulous. She's out of El Paso. Um, and so she, as a student, may be able to kind of round up the students and you know, have some communication on that level uh, to try to get that engagement going. So uh, that, that would be one suggestion that I have is to make use of Trinity because Trinity is dying to have somebody in her division <laughs> reach out and to her. <laughs> would you send me her contact information? Yes, I will. I'll, yeah. I'll put an email together uh, to Trinity and copy you so that you guys have each other's contact information. Before all this happened, we met once a month with all the key clubs, with their advisors, with their uh, Qantas advisors, uh, their, their officers, uh, break pizza, just so that we were talking to each other as this is Las Cruces and this is who are the players are. Right, I'd like to see if we can possibly get that back virtually that Vicki uh, established and we at least have this virtual uh, monthly meeting. Yeah, that's terrific. And Debbie, I know you've been waiting patiently for a comment. It's good to see you, by the way. Okay, good to see you too. Uh, been, this has been fabulous. Um, and somebody mentioned maybe doing it quarterly. Um, I'm in a community choir. I mean, it was killing us not to get together. And we were doing every two weeks and it was fabulous. And we had theme night, every, every meeting was a theme. So we had our hat night and we had a beach night and we had patriotic night. and and we met every two weeks. We didn't get to sing much together because of the, the way it went, but it, it was quite fun. It kept us motivated and together. So I'm, we have not met yet. We're in New Mexico. So uh, our officers were supposed to get together and it didn't happen. And now that after this meeting, I'm kind of pumped up and gonna try to get that to happen and see if we can do some of these Zoom meetings. But you were talking about losing a lot of advisors. Um, the, what, right after I joined Kiwanis, uh, I was teaching at an elementary school and I was the, the Kiwanis advisor. And we were, uh, we're a very small club now, but we were a bigger club then. And we went through three, before I came, they had gone through three advisors. They, that every semester they were getting a new advisor, faculty advisor. So what I suggested is if I found a teacher that was willing to in name be the faculty advisor 
and let us use her classroom. And then I, as the Kiwanis advisor, really kind of did the faculty advisor part. So some of you bigger clubs, if, you, if you're short an advisor, that might be a, a way to, to get it started until you can find an advisor. Yeah, and thank you for mentioning that because you guys do that. I know there are other clubs that do that too. Um, and, you know, it's one of those situations with whatever works. Right. Uh, you know, we're bringing the service to the kids and it's okay. You know, we have some schools where the faculty advisors do everything. Um, somewhere it's an even split, but it's totally fine for the faculty advisor really to be like the facilities coordinator and for the Kiwanis right. advisor uh, to be the lead. It's just whatever works right. for the- Well, and I think it's getting harder and harder and harder to find teachers willing to be faculty advisors unless they're part of the Kiwanis family and understand and get it. And so until I moved up, I was at elementary school and I got permission from my principal to go to the lunch meetings. But until I moved up to the high school, I was the Kiwanis advisor, but I was functioning as the faculty advisor. So just a thought might help somebody out. Yeah, good thought. Dr. Gertz, you have a thought on this too? Do and I'd love I know which I know which button to push to see myself. So I think, I know I'm getting good at this. Um, I think one of the issues with getting faculty advisors are the restrictions and limitations that our districts place on everybody. Um, everything from if you volunteer at Phoenix Union High School District and work with students, you have to go through four hours of orientation. By the way, that's conveniently located uh, once a month on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, so, and we, 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 unfortunately, we have to do that for the safety of our students. But that's, those are the issues that we face um, from the school perspective. So I think, Debbie, your idea about having a Kiwana come in and serve as the faculty advisor is awesome. And I think it's doable, but it really will require somebody to understand what the restrictions are at the district level for the safety of students. And and just to say, this has been an ongoing thing. I've really seen a change in the last, <clears throat> excuse me, five years. Um, for example, in Phoenix Union, we also added a criminal background check, which, you know, not every, you know, I want to volunteer 10 years ago, I did something that I really don't want to relive, for example. Um, so it is becoming more difficult, not just from finding a faculty advisor, but to having um, interactions with the public. At the same time, when we at the curriculum level are constantly talking about real world experiences, you know, so on the one hand, we're saying, let's get our kids out there, have real world experiences. And on the other hand, we're putting in safety measures that make it more difficult. So, right. And, and it's it's bigger, we're a very small community and one high school and, and very small. And so we do it's weird. I taught 30 years and retired, and I still had to fill out the volunteer form. They didn't make me get my background check, but I already have one with Kiwanis anyway. But those things are in, but they're still not as restrictive as the larger cities and larger communities. So I, I hear you. Um, it, it's a shame. And, and I think just teachers, the new teachers um, are not they're not, I don't know, service oriented. They're not into clubs and, and doing those kind of things. I just, I think it's, it's just getting harder and harder and harder to find somebody who will commit to be a, a, a faculty advisor. I know for me, I'm, I'm looking at probably retiring in the next, I don't know, few years, let's say. <laughs> and, and I know, I know. But so I'm already actively trying to find a replacement for me. And, and so I'm trying to get someone in to, to learn, like be a co-advisor or something so that we don't have this problem at our school, that I leave and all of a sudden it's, it's chaos. Yeah, so okay. I'm really struggling with that. 
Well, we let me there. know when you're retiring so that I can retire too. <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to do this job without you. No, I get it. I get it. So, if I could just be a key club faculty advisor, it'd be great. <laughs> no teaching. No teaching. Yeah. <laughs> you you can be the lunch lady, and the faculty advisor. That works. Hey, if they let me do it. Maybe I will. Yeah. <laughs> Debbie, you were, you were talking about when I became the Zia Builder uh, Builders Club advisor in the junior high. I know they had to fill out the paperwork for Qantas and its background check. I had the school district, the Las Cruces School District. I had to fill out paperwork. I had to have a, another background check. Uh, ultimately, it led to that uh, I was considered to be completely kosher and was given a staff badge. So I can walk into that uh, that building, but as advisor to the key club, I have to sign in. My my yeah. staff badge doesn't carry over from one school building to the next. But I do too. That that was one thing that really surprised me is they they won't talk to me about anything key club. They won't talk about my budget. They won't talk about our our accounts, the money that we're putting in, and different things like that. I have been closed down completely. And I have to sign in. Every time I go up to high school, I have to sign in. So it was really kind of a shock. I didn't think that would happen, but it did. So. <laughs> who, who the still up is from uh, Los Alamos? Karen? I think, I think I'm the only one left, but I'm not, okay. I'm not officially. A Interestingly teacher. enough, I had a young man who is a server at the High Desert Brewery, uh, one of the other servers and managers there handed me her dues check for Quantas. And he turned to me and he said, are you a Quanian? I said, yeah. He says, I was in Key Club in Los Alamos. I've been looking for a club to join. Nice, who is it? Uh, Jeremy, and I don't know Jeremy's last name. Okay, yeah, my, my, dad, um, my dad is probably in bed now. But <laughs> he left. I think he left. Um, yeah. But my dad was my was the Kiwanis advisor when I was in the Los Alamos High School Key Club. So my it, my dad would know who that is. <laughs> it, it's really strange, you know, how the recruitment com comes about. Yeah, absolutely. So and Karen, does when were you in uh, Los Alamos High School as I graduated from there as well? <laughs> what year? 85. Okay, I was 87. So we we're there at the same time. Amazing. Does anybody I know, know, does that two-year forgiveness rule still provide uh, from international and southwest district that if they were a key clubber? I don't, I don't yeah. think the district dues. Debbie, do you know? I kind of know because we are, we're about to die and we're trying to recruit or people and one of my good former key clubbers contacted me asking if there was a Kiwanis club in Farmington and I said well there's one in Aztec she lives in Bloomfield and Bloomfield folded so she said well and I said we'd love to have you well she joined and I'm cleaning my house and such and office stuff and, and just doing a bunch of stuff I gave her whole bunch of rosters, key club rosters, and contact information. And I contacted International and I got our whole membership list from forever. And I gave it to her and she's been working on recruiting oh, yeah. former key clubbers for us. We have two that have joined and we have two more that are, I think will come, up, come along also. Awesome. That, yeah. that was and kind of a neat thing. Um, they do get two years, um, if, but if I remember right, and it, there is a twenty-five dollar fee or something. Um, the the magazine. They are exempt from dues for two years. And, and, and one of the key clubbers that I registered with International or put in as members, um, I got that kind of 
notification back that since they were former whatever you know they have two years of no deal it, but i know there's a 25 dollars fee because it shows up on our on our um, invoice from international yeah well ken is commenting in the in the chat so so ken is it is it um, international dues waived, international and district, but then you still have like the insurance and magazine. Do you know what the details are? So, so you are correct. So um, uh, we've argued with the international about the way they do this. It's a little bit misleading. And, and so what you have to remember are there are dues and there are fees. Okay. So the $52 international dues are waived, but the fees are not waived. And the fees are $8 for the magazine, um, $4, $4 for the directors and officers insurance, and then um, 14, it's your 13 or $14 for liability insurance. And then the Southwest District dues are $40, but technically that really is a fee. So that is also waived for the first two years. So, so it's the uh, $8 and then the two insurance fees, which come to $17 that they do have to pay. Okay. I want to be clear because that, it was the second thought. I, he's very excited. I'm getting membership forms for him. And then I said, oh, wait a minute. You're a bonus baby. I got an even better deal for you. Of course, we have what up to the October the 1st to put new members in at no uh, no, it expires. It expires on September 30th. So we only have uh, 14 more days on that. Yeah, 14 more days. Right. So, um, and, and please remember that the cost of insurance, so both insurance fees, are able to be paid out of the service account. Right. And if, the, if the member pays it out of the admin account, they can reimburse that from the service account because it is a cost of doing service. Okay. Thank you, Ken. Got it. Now, now all I got to do is go out and find me more, more uh, oh, alumni. <laughs> keep yeah. Yeah. And there's not a CKI at state, is there? We can't get one going. Uh, we've never been able to find an advisor. I thought mm -hmm. I had one. Um, there doesn't seem to be a real burning interest in Circle K uh, mm -hmm. at New Mexico. Well, they're even clamping down everything is kind of shut down. So I mean, the fraternities, the sororities are, are shut down for all intents and purposes. So there is no real, we have a few students going back on campus, but primarily some are uh, hybrid classes. There's not a lot of activity going on the, uh, the campus 